Welcome to Netbook Study. This is the newspaper analysis of 25th July 2023. Let's start the discussion. The main article in the newspaper talks about Manipur violence. Home Minister Amit Shah has given a statement. A monsoon session is going on and uh, Amit Shah told that the government is ready for a discussion on Manipur on the floor of the house. He also mentioned that country needs to know the truth about the sensitive situation that is going on in Manipur state. Uh, this would be enough on this. Let's move on to the next article. In the next article, the, uh, the information provided in the article is not important, but there is a mention of EPFO and that, that is important from your exam perspective. The article talks about that uh, government has approved 8% uh, interest rate for provident fund. But let's get into the basics of EPFO. EPFO was established under the Act of Employment Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provision Act of 1952 and the main A objective is to provide social security to the workers who are working in the country and it work uh, it comes under the Ministry of Labor and Employment. There are three important major schemes of EPFO. One is pension scheme, one is insurance and the th third one is EPFO scheme. The first one is EPFO scheme of 1952 when the uh, organization is constituted next comes the pension scheme of 1995 actually pension scheme of 1995 is in use continuously and insurance scheme of 1976 let's move to the next article the next article is about gyanwapi mask uh, the varnasi court has given an order that uh, scientific survey has to be conducted of uh, of the mask complex area but Supreme Court had stayed it for a day so that the aggrieved uh, parties can approach to Allahabad High Court on the, regarding this matter. This is the news. But here it, here it is a mention of ASI, Archaeological Survey of India, that is going to conduct the scientific survey at Gyanwapi Mosque. And let me give you guys brief introduction on ASI. It works under the Ministry of Culture and it has been constituted under the Act of uh, Ancient Monument and Archaeological Science and Remains Act that has been passed in 1958 and it is a statutory body that the main objective is research, conservation and protection and preservation of ancient monuments. There is another act that also works under uh, ASI that is Antiquities and Art Treasures Act of 1972. Uh, it is founded in 1861 but the uh, statutory status has been given in 19, under the 1958 act. It's founded in 1861 by James Cunningham. Headquarters is in New Delhi and it have asi is protect it has uh, 3500 protected monuments and archaeological sites of national importance around the country it has main three publications one is ancient india epigraphia indica and indian archaeology a review let's move on to the next article the next article is important from a mains perspective. There are two articles have come on the gig workers related issue. The, this article talks about Rajasthan is has placed a bill in their assembly regarding social security for gig workers. And there is a one more article uh, after editorials where it has been uh, clearly explained the various provisions of this bill. What I'll do is I'll combine both the articles and I'll give all the information which has been mentioned in these uh, articles. Before explaining the provisions of bill, let me give you guys basic uh, brief introduction regarding uh, uh, gig workers. Gig workers are temporary or a part-time workers and uh, they usually consist of income earning activities outside the standard or long-term employer employee relationship on the whole gig economy is a labor market that really relies heavily on temporary and part-time position filled by independent contractors and freelancers the examples like ola drivers or a zomato delivery boys these belongs to a gig economy and this is a gig work criteria they typically use digital platforms and hire for a short period of time. They are not considered as a permanent workforce of an organization. Uh, as I gave examples like uh, ride hailing apps, food delivery application, holiday rental apps. These are the examples. And what are the reasons? Let's see what are the reasons for these gig workers in the country. One thing is entire scenario has been changed uh, after pandemic COVID. 
and it has give uh, given opportunity for uh, these kind of activities and it gives freedom to work from anywhere and wide range of applicants are available from the delivery to the driving and your skill set can be used at the various platforms and there is a rise of technology and internet and that will give an opportunity for both employers and employee and it is extremely convenient for small organization they don't have to hire full time employees even their uh, 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 their necessity is limited so they don't have to hire a full time employer and pay accordingly so this gives an opportunity for new enterprises to grow at initial stages and it it also benefits employers and it gives it is a concept of work for all that uh, I, it's by, with my will and uh, with my ability i am willing to work under the organization with the necessity condition they have been uh, quoted in their agreement and what are the challenges to it the main challenge is there is no job security here since it is freelance and it is not agreement based so there is a job secure uh, there is a thing for job security here extremely low job security and no regular job benefits they might get incentives based on their performance but you won't be having a regular job benefits is extremely if there are very companies which give uh, job incentives and favorable uh, necessary environment to these workers and also there are hurdle in growth of uh, full time employee if, uh, companies are hiring employees like a uh, a freelance or a short term or a temporary basis definitely it is going to affect the full time employee hiring process on the whole let's see what are the provisions of this bill uh, rajasthan government it is a play, it has placed this bill uh, that is gig workers registration and welfare uh, bill to 2023 uh, this bill has a stringent provisions against errant agri aggregators aggregators are those are uh, digital intermediaries that connects both buyers and sellers and this bill applies both to the aggregators as well as a uh, uh, employers uh, who work in under that digital platform so this bill applies to aggregator and also primary employers both of them comes under this bill the main provision under this bill is it is creating gig workers welfare board and this plays very important role and it uh, there is a mechanism to set up welfare fund also and this welfare fund will be used for the betterment of the people who work as a free freelancers under this digital uh, intermediaries a welfare cess will be collected and that cess will be uh, help to fund this welfare board and uh, the fund collected through the cess that money will be used for insurance and other social uh, security aspects of gig workers and there will be an unique id that will be given to all uh, gig workers that all platform based gig workers they are registered with any platform will be automatically registered with the board and each uh, uh, these gig workers will be given an unique id and this unique id will remain for many years and being an aggregator what are the duties they have to follow the thing is the first thing is they have to go collect welfare cess on time and they have to provide that welfare cess to the welfare fund and updating the database of gig workers again the, it is the duty and finally the doc if there any changes in the company or if there any changes in their working procedures and environment that has to be documented and that has to be sent to the gig workers welfare board there is there is also a provision under this bill where uh, gig workers have an opportunity to uh, to place their grievances uh, if they are uh, facing any bias or if they are facing any issues regarding their aggregators uh, they can face their uh, they can place their grievances under a board that will also be handled under this bill in the next article isro has uh, launched pslv c56 and it is carrying singapore's imaging satellite here in this article you have to focus on uh, two issues the details which has been mentioned in the article is nowhere uh, important from the exam perspective the extreme details of uh, the satellite that is being carried by pslv c16 that has been mentioned here since it is a, a singapore satellite and it is not required from exam perspective but what you have to focus here is uh, see geography from uh, uh, sorry see singapore from geography perspective and also know the difference between pslv and gslv if you understand the orbits 
orbits of uh, that polar orbit or a geosynchronous orbit it is easier to know the distinction between what exactly PSLV does and GSLV does. Let me show you guys the position of uh, uh, Singapore here. This is the equator and Singapore is situated above the equator in this region. Let me show you guys in detail. Singapore is situated here and you can see Malaysia on the north and Indonesia, the islands of Indo the islands of Indonesia in the south and this is the Strait of Malacca and here it is Javan Sea and uh, equator runs somewhere here and it is situated above the equator. Let's talk about PSLV and GSLV. PSLV is Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle. Polar satellites are those satellites which revolve from North Pole to South Pole. This is the polar orbit and if a satellite is placed in this orbit then it is called polar satellite. And the launch vehicles which places satellite there are called PSLV. PS, uh, polar orbits are lower earth orbits. You would see polar satellites around the range of 300 kilometers. And there is another uh, orbit called Sun Synchronous Orbit. Sun Synchronous Orbit also comes near to polar orbit, not exactly the uh, degree of polar orbit, but there will be an angle of deviation between uh, the Sun Synchronous Orbit and polar orbit. Any orbit which around polar orbits, usually you consider them as a solar uh, Sun Synchronous Orbit. The next orbit is uh, a geostationary orbit. Here in geostationary orbits are exactly above the equator and the and the satellites which are placed on geostationary orbit are geostationary satellites. Usually these uh, satellites are placed at the distance of 30, 35,000 kilometers. Polar orbit is near, it is low earth orbit. So the sa satellite placed here is are usually 300 kilometers but geostationary satellites are placed at the uh, length of uh, 35,000 kilometers and we have a geosynchronous orbit. Geosynchronous orbit uh, it usually it's like a sun synchronous orbit to a polar orbit where this geosynchronous orbit it usually lies in, uh, in and around geostationary orbit just with the angle of uh, deviation with their and GSLV satellites are GSLV uh, uh, satellite launch vehicles are used to place satellites either in geosynchronous orbit or geostationary orbit. Let's move on to the editorials. Uh, the first editorial is about India Sri Lanka relationship. Recently, uh, President of Sri Lanka has visited India and there was discussion between Prime Minister Modi and President of Sri Lanka and there were agreements have been signed between two countries. Here there are some issues have been mentioned in this uh, uh, editorials and author has told that steps are necessary in this uh, regarding these issues to make our relationship better uh, in this direction. Let me give you guys brief introduction regarding India uh, Sri Lanka relationship before getting to the article. We have a you know shared cultural history, we have socio economic heritage, and even people to people interactions are we uh, it's going on from centuries between India and Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka is also strategically very important to India. The position of Sri Lanka in Indian Ocean is extremely crucial for India's security. And if we look at cultural connection, we have Ramayana, we have Buddhism connection that connects both the countries. And the north and northeastern region, the Jaffna region of Sri Lanka is economically integrated to India and Indian origin Tamils reside in that region especially. And in 1998, India and Sri Lanka, we uh, signed an agreement, that free trade agreement in 1998. And we are cooperating with each other in various forums like BIMSTEC, SARC 
so we have that multilateral cooperation with each other from so many years and there are some challenges with uh, in in our relationship with sri lanka the main thing is here china factor china is actively involved in belt and road initiative and uh, sri lanka is one among the active participants and even china's chinese presence in hambantota port and colombo port has been a matter of concern for indian security and it has been raised time and again with uh, uh, sri lankan leadership and there is a lack of bipartisan support to india from sri lanka in many a times uh, uh, sri lanka did not support india's efforts in uh, world organization like uno it uh, abstained from voting so you you can see that uh, bipartisan uh, support uh, lack of bipartisan support from uh, sri lankan side and there is a ethnic issue that is going on especially indian origin tamil minorities who are residing there there is almost 8% uh, for total population of sri lanka has indian origin tamil minority and that ethnic issue is going on from several years that is also an another challenge between two countries and the fisher arrest of fisherman and issue the confrontation that is happening between uh, indian fisherman and the sri lankan authorities the time and again the chief ministers of tamil nadu have raised this issue and uh, they have told center to take necessary actions in this perspective these are the main challenges and let's see the what exactly the tamil issue that is going on from so many decades between two countries the uh, Sri Lanka they have devised a mechanism and it made them very tough for the Tamils to acquire a citizenship of Sri Lanka then in 1964 Lal Bahadur Shastri and Sirimavo of Sri Lanka they filed a pact they signed a pact where Sri Lanka agreed to give 3 lakh Indian uh, the Tamils uh, as a Ceylon citizenship at the same time India has agreed to take sizable number uh, to India from that uh, uh, Jaffna region and uh, but the situation has uh, deteriorated extremely especially in uh, the 1977 and 1981 due to uh, tamil riots there and in 1987 there was an accord india sri lanka accord uh, which gave uh, in that accord there was a discussion to give some autonomy to tamil areas and uh, that led to the rise of 13th amendment the 13th amendment of sri lanka sri lankan constitution it is an outcome of that indian and lanka accord of uh, 1987 it has been signed the between uh, rajiv gandhi he was a prime minister of india at that time and the president of sri lanka jr jayawardhane in this uh, accord and in this through this amendment it was an attempt to solve sri lankan ethnic uh, conflict that was going on and but the, there was a civil war between uh, our armed forces and also uh, ltte liberation of uh, tigers of tamil elam that led to a struggle of separate ltte was asking for a separate a state for a indian origin tamils but the, this confrontation between armed forces of sri lanka and ltte was going on uh, from many years actually then finally with the help of 13th amendment the constitution of uh, sri lanka and the parliament of sri lanka they have agreed to provide uh, they have agreed to set up some provincial governments across the country uh, they, they told that there will be nine provincial councils and these provincial councils will be having uh, strategic autonomy so that they can take their own decision and law and order will be under their control so this was the issue and also they agreed to make tamil as an official language and english as a link language uh usually uh, the sri lanka is a sinhalese country sinhala language is the majority there but under this 13th amendment they have decided to uh, act they have decided to give some autonomy to the uh, various regions including uh, the tamil the indian origin tamil region who resides in the jaffna area but the thing is uh, even after so many years uh, even after changing of so many governments in uh, sri lanka 13th amendment was never been implemented and that has been a matter of concern and bone of contention between two countries even the pact has been signed but there was no concrete effort of impl uh, implementing this from the politicians of sri lanka let's see the editorial uh, last week the sri lankan president ranil wickremesinghe he visited india and both prime minister modi and wickremesinghe they had a discussion and they signed various agreement and they have released joint statement as well the, that statement is uh, india sri lanka economic partnership vision and they had a, a route map the future route map and a vision for next few years 
in that main five core areas are maritime air and that is air connectivity energy trade and people to people connection these are the five core areas that has been given prominence under this vision statement and some are some some of the other aspects including uh, uh, there was an agreement to develop ports and airports in sri lanka uh, with the help of india and there is an uh, um, proposal and also an agreement to connect a nagapattinam of india and also uh, city of sri lanka and there was also an effort to develop wind and solar uh, plants in sri lanka that is renewable energy development in uh, sri lanka and decision to improve trade and to support uh, sri lankan economy uh, india has been supporting sri lankan economy from many years and recently the, uh, in last year also sri lanka was undergoing some economic crisis at that time also india gave a line of credit and also india uh, sub, uh, supported uh, sri lanka in under uh, imf uh, uh, bailout package as well india is implementing uh, UPA, UPI digital payment in Sri Lanka and there are some other uh, uh, steps including uh, uh, India decided to designate in Indian rupee Sri Lanka decided to designate Indian rupee as a currency of trade and they have also agreed uh, to enhance tourism cultural religious and education collaboration between the countries see if you look at all these aspects vision has a comprehensive plan for future whether it's economy cultural aspects or renewable energy poor development people to people uh, connection various has been various uh, areas have been uh, covered under this uh, statement and it has been it's like a comprehensive plan for future but it lacks a clear visible road map and also there is no mention of 13th amendment and arrest of fisherman issues uh, uh, especially in these statement and these things are extremely crucial these are a these are matter of concern these are bone of contention issues of bone of contention between two countries and if you don't address these issues it is going to affect our relationship in a long run even if we have taken 10 positive steps towards this and affect these two can drag back those developments we have achieved in other sectors as well so addressing these issues are extremely important and this is this is what all third tells again and again in this article and uh, in this article it has been mentioned that prime minister modi has uh, some is he told in his speech that uh, life uh, life of respect and dignity for tamil is extremely important it is just a statement in his speech but it did not find a space in the agreement or in a document this is again uh, you are not prioritizing the issue that need to be addressed somewhere you are uh, trying to avoid these kind of issue and author says that this is not a good move you need to address these issue and you should take this as a priority rather than anything else and any vision without these issues will be considered incomplete what author trying to convey here is yes we have taken all positive actions there are economic uh, movement is there there is a cultural connection is there and all these activities are fine but we need to address these core issues these are extremely critical somewhere he says that avoiding these kind of issues any the relationship is going to suffer in a long run this is this is it about this article let's move on to the next next editorial the next editorial is about ASEAN summit. Uh, recently, a 56th a foreign minister meeting held in Jakarta, Indonesia, and there some decision have been taken. And even leaders from other countries, that finance ministers and the external affairs ministers of other countries, also attended this particular meeting. And uh, author talks about there is a lack of unity among ASEAN members and this article gives that question mark at the end of the opinion uh, before getting to the article let me give you guys a brief introduction regarding ASEAN uh, you see the ASEAN the full form it stands for association of southeast asian nations and it is a regional organization the main objective behind establishing this is to promote political and social stability the motto of ASEAN is one vision one identity and one community uh, the, the the main uh, secretariat ASEAN secretariat is in Jakarta Indonesia and it has been established in 1970 1967 under Bangkok declaration you have to remember this particular thing that 1967 and Bangkok declaration rest of the things are very general in nature and uh, 
the chairmanship of asean it's usually uh, changes annually and it rotates on the basis of alphabetical order and this is the third largest market in the world the biggest is european union and the next one comes the north indian north american market and asean is the third uh, biggest markets in the world the southeast asia it is considered as a heart of indo pacific region and recently the 56 foreign minister a meet held in jakarta especially asean foreign minister meet in this meet even foreign ministers of other major pay players also attended the event even indian uh, representative were uh, also there in the event and let's see what are the major visions and challenges uh, for this asean and how do we see this asean in future the world is going through transformation uh, transformative changes in every decade there will be some kind of change is happening around the world if we if we see this decade there was sudden covid pandemic and the ukraine crisis climate china is climate change issue and there is a uh, altercation the cold war kind of thing is going on between china and usa facing all these issues asean has fared well by comparative to other uh, blockings around the world so it is a good thing and even it has been considered as a ep epicentrum of global growth in this uh, in that finance uh, minister meet it has been told by indonesia that uh, asean is considered as a epicentrum of global growth yes it has uh, showed its potential and it has fared well the three communities plays very important role in this the interrelated dimension of these communities are extremely necessary one is political community second one is economic community third one is social cultural community political community is important because it maintains that regional peace and along with region peace there is a necessity to maintain the democratic environment that responsibility is with political community and then come economic community economic community where it in integrates that regional economic with uh, global economy so this is extremely important when you are uh, dealing with other countries when you are having a successful trade relationship around the world so you need that integration and then come socio-cultural community and these socio-cultural communities are responsible for social developmental aspects of uh, ASEAN countries and especially this social cultural community is mainly focusing on uh, sustainable development goals especially with related to ASEAN citizens and this has been successful when you consider ASEAN uh, grouping but in order to be more successful and uh, more uh, geopolitical aspect then ASEAN should navigate the regional dynamics it has to consider the core issues that are affecting the ASEAN itself that priority should be there and it, it should uh, focus the you know the charter whatever it has been formed under that has to be the priority here the main uh, charter here is social and political coordination somewhere if you look at asean somewhere it lacks it is that unity is missing there are some internal differences that are affecting the group especially if you look at myanmar issue where military has to cover the, the administration and there is there are thailand is facing some issues and these internal differences are affecting the group that needs to be addressed and also asean is very necessary to balance to have that balance between china and uh, usa and the thing is they are not even voicing against uh, china regarding south china issue there is aggression and coercion is happening from chinese side but entire group as an asean they are not voicing their concern in that region philippines is the only country in the region which is uh, vocally uh, raising this concern regarding the china but rest of the country somewhere if you look at it many countries in the region have become virtual dependencies on china they are whether it's financially or other aspects infrastructure related somewhere there there is a dependency on china and that dependency is making that dependency is affecting your strategic autonomy even when countries like usa is voicing against chinese aggression in the region and chinese coercion in the region but still there is no proper support from other aspects there is no proper support from regional players in the region and this shows that there is a geopolitical tension in the region but 
ASEAN is focusing on economy development, uh, sustainable development goals. Yes, it is good. ASEAN is reiterating its uh, centrality. It means that they are uh, a region, they act as a block. But the ground reality is it. it it tells us some other story. The ground reality is different than what ASEAN is portraying. Without unity, the group loses its credibility. So that has to be addressed first. And moving on to Arthur says that what is India's role in the grouping? Because we have a similar interest. India is looking for free and open uh, uh, Indo-Pacific region and even ASEAN countries also expect the same and there is a congruence in Indo-Pacific strategy in this aspect but we should move beyond that just having a uh, congruence in one aspect just having similar interest in one aspect is not going to help both the countries you know the blocking of uh, ASEAN and India we need to work on newer areas maybe whether it's a cyber security economic interest and ma maritime security these aspects should also be explored along with uh, Indo-Pacific strategy and author somewhere he has the opinion that this meet was not a much progress as everybody expected because the ASEAN countries they did not voice their concerns in the region so it is just like a diplomatic dialogue a summit rather than proper action have been avoided and even they did not even uh, showed their unity in the podium as well let's move on to the next article uh, this article is re regarding the risk of disaster. This is the opinion page and this has given some uh, 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 points which are you can you can use these points in your mains answer. This article is pretty good from this perspective. Let's uh, get into the article and dis uh, discuss these aspects. Disaster is climbing lives around the world and climate change effects are uh, visible these days. You know, if you look at it, forest fire in Greece and forest fires in Australia, the intensity is rising and even the frequency is also increasing day by day. And recently, very recent, and it is still going on the Yamuna flood. It shows the, the risk of all these disaster and efficiency of managing these disasters. All these show shows how crucial disaster management is for the nation development and world needs to be prepared and world needs more to prevent this disaster maybe it's a natural disaster or a biological disaster like covid kind of pandemic situation but what we are doing is we are spending money in billions to respond to the disaster see now the uh, Yamuna flood is happening the government is spending a lot of money it is to the respond of disaster but if the same money would have spent before the uh, disaster happens the, for the prevention then it could have saved a lot of lives and it could have saved money in turn as well. This issue needs to be addressed in order to have a proper disaster management in the country and the global roadmap of disaster risk reduction that is Sendai framework it gives that uh, what are the steps that have to be followed and it gives that roadmap for next 15 years from 2015 to uh, 2030 it has that roadmap but if but there is very little success uh, to this uh, roadmap and no very few countries are following what are the steps or the procedures that have been mentioned in the, the Sendai framework. So we need renewed sense of urgency and also people centric approaches are extremely important to make any policies regarding disaster risk management as successful in future. And what are the India's initiatives in this direction? And very recent, if you look at it, India has established D20 Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group. Uh, but even there are some initiatives like National Disaster Management Act and National Disaster Management Authorities and even Disaster Management Authorities at state level have been uh, established in the country and district level also been established in our country. India has been very seriously taken this issue but the success rate is extremely crucial here. So we need that upgradation, we need that progress and that progress should be the people that should come from people centric approach and we need that sense of urgency in this perspective. 
and we cannot consider this disaster management as an isolated issue no it is not because economy is directly linked and related to disaster management one disaster can wipe out the, the economic development of a decades so this even for economic and social development disaster management is extremely crucial and author says that three perspective three aspects are extremely crucial to have a successful disaster management in a country the first thing is enhancing early warning system second thing is to have a resilient infrastructure in the country and third thing is financing for the disaster risk re reduction these things are three things are extremely crucial to have a sound disaster management in the system as i said first thing for the first issue is early warning system that is extremely important uh, as an example if we see the cyclone bipa joy the you know because of the proper early warning system it helped to achieve zero deaths and if you look at few years ago uh, there was a cyclone in uh, odisha and it killed thousands of people and now because of proper early warning system not even single death happened so that is that that shows that early warning systems are ex extremely crucial and this system should be inclusive and it should have a multi hazard warning system it is not only like one hazard we have a early warning system for various natural and man made hazard that could then only it would would help us it would serve us for disaster management and next come then the second issue is enhancing the resilience of infrastructure we have that infrastructure that should be resilient for disasters when the disaster happen these critical infrastructures are extremely important to mitigate these disasters and even it helps in disaster management on the whole you know the uh, we had a flood in new zealand it affected auckland airport and also there are some natural calamities in usa these years then all of them could be handled only with the help of resilience in their infrastructure without this it could have caused much more uh, damage to the entire society because of the resilience in their infrastructure the damages were minimum the mitigation happens very soon and it helps to withstand the disaster risk and in 2009 india along with uno it launched a coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure this is a positive mode but proper working has to be done uh, for the implementation of these disaster uh, disaster resilient infrastructure in the country and this is extremely crucial for developing country because if developed countries are some, somewhere they have this kind of resilient infrastructure system in their overall development pro process but uh, as a developing countries it is extremely crucial for us to have this uh, system in our development process and finally it comes the financing without financing it is not going to be effective the financing the disaster risk uh, management is extremely important one thing is the proper government policies that plays important role and the thing is co private collaboration and private funding is extremely necessary to tackle this issue especially for developing countries we have the deficit we have that financial fiscal deficit so we need private participation also and if the private participation comes in the way of funding it is going to help the mitigation of disasters and the disaster management it will take up that uh, effort into a next level so we need proper government policies along with private funding as well the collaboration of both is extremely important and whatever the allocation happens the allocation of funding finances that has to be uh, happen at sub national level also and local level also as i told you we have a national disaster management we, management authority we have a state disaster management authority and we have district disaster management authority as well the nas we have a national sub national and local level and even funding allocation will also be on the same lines if the funding is going at the it is concentrated at the single junction then it is again it poses a question mark and it poses the question mark on the credibility of entire disaster management mechanism so all the three aspects has to be addressed properly to have a efficient disaster management methodology in a country and uh, we have to work on all the three areas and we have to scale up our ecosystem and it has to be based on people centric approaches uh, at the end uh, the author sums it up as it you know a, we have to enhance our disaster mitigation approaches we have to enhance our disaster management strategies and uh, 
along with that the national and local res response capabilities to these disasters also be improved even local level capabilities has to be concentrated in these processes this is it for the day guys i'll see you guys tomorrow thank you for listening have a good time